Oh no, my friends, you are not mistaken. This mean old ugly mug, this old hunk of junk car, copyright free music, it'll only be time for one thing, cruise peruse, baby, on the Sky Lounge Podcast. Episode number 317, freed up nights and weekend days, cruising, untitled rant as we get going on the road, boys and girls, as we are set to start our Friday evening. Although I'm more of an early sleeper, so it's going to be some, some midday action we're going through. But kids, kids, I, I spell nights specifically with the K because I want to talk about my Vegas Golden Knights. Yes, allow me to toot my own horn a little bit as the Golden Knights have started on a 4-0 record with a game in hand today against the Arizona Coyotes in Arizona. This is going to be the first road game for the Vegas Golden Knights in this very condensed season where every game and every win and every points matter. So the fact that the Vegas Golden Knights are starting off hot with eight straight points out of possible eight in their first four games is good news. Now, shout out to my guy, VGK Coverage, who is just doing an absolutely fantastic job over there on his channel. Each and every game day, he goes live, he comments on top of what's going on in the action, and honestly, man, if you folks, you know, don't get to watch a lot of uh, Vegas Golden Knights action, check out VGK Coverage. His insight, along with his humor, is just absolutely fantastic, and I always veer people towards the Vegas Golden Knights uh, knowledge and uh, expertise and context to VGK coverage. A man knows what he's talking about when it comes to hockey. But I'll be honest, there is a bit of a difference for me and VGK coverage. There's a lot of optimism uh, within the VGK coverage uh, perspective, which I do appreciate. But me, I'm a negative Nancy. I am a Debbie Downer. I am the realistic asshole <laughs> that shits on everyone's parade, which fair, fair play. You know, we, we kind of need that in, in all sorts of fandoms. But my thing is simply this. Yes, the Vegas Golden Knights are on a hot 4-0 start, but who have the two opponents been? A still somewhat rebuilding, revamping Anaheim Ducks team with a John Gibson just carrying dead bodies and Maxime Comtois being the only one who scored in the first two games uh, against the Vegas Golden Knights. And a bunch of, I don't know, a bunch of dudes and with the Arizona Coyotes, it's again kind of the same story where Darcy Kemper is standing on his own head and you got a bunch of assholes not showing up. Yes, I recognize that the Arizona Coyotes do have some talent. I mean, any NHL roster technically does, man. I mean, let's not get this shit twisted, but the Coyotes, I've said for many times um, on the podcast or on the reviews that they're really underrated and overlooked because of either their geographical location or just the lack of coverage. And, of course, their rather mediocre uh, postseason record, almost non-existent postseason record at this point. But what genuinely pissed me off is, yeah, I know the Coyotes have talent. I know they're good enough, but they haven't been showing out. And so I can't honestly say that the Vegas Golden Knights are world beaters right now. I can't. I may look at someone like a Tampa Bay Lightning, a maybe a Colorado Avalanche, despite their relative uh, bad result to the Kings last night. But again, I still say no, because the Kings are a much better competition than what the Coyotes and the Anaheim Ducks have been giving uh, to the Vegas Golden Knights relative to the Colorado Avalanche. And so I'd say, you know, let's pump the brakes on... Um, who's top in the league right now, as I literally pumped the brakes. But, yeah, I mean, certainly the Vegas Golden Knights are going to be a top contender um, if they maintain this level of consistency, this level of excellence, this level of uh, dominance, really, in the West uh, so far. But we know damn well that nothing is given in hockey. Nothing's come, nothing comes for free. Nothing is set. Any given fucking, you know, hour on the ice, right, I will technically hour, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, but we got all the stoppage and all that shit. But regardless, all that shit 
and you just got to prove yourself out there. And, you know, thankfully the Vegas Golden Knights have been getting them wins. And so hopefully, hopefully as they travel on the road to Arizona, the Vegas Golden Knights can grab a win tonight. That would be huge and to bolster that confidence and maybe close out the series with four wins, last game being on Sunday. That'd be great. But again, folks, if you do not have immediate access to watching the Vegas Golden Knights on your television, or you can't watch it some other legal way, go check out VGK coverage on YouTube and just double check the time when the Vegas Golden Knights games are going to be up because the man does live commentating. It's fantastic. I don't know if he's going to do it for every game. I hope he does because I I absolutely love it. I, I get on you know, chat within the chat room, which happens to be very, um, very banter filled. And I, I love that because it's, it's all in good fun, right? I mean, you shit talk, but you know, you slap each other. It, it's, it's all love, baby. It's all love because we, we love the sport of hockey, right? Simultaneously, you know, me being a lover of hockey, I also love other things, man. I love, I love soccer. You know me, you know me, I'm a, I'm a soccer boy at heart. Love me some baseball. Love me some basketball. Love me some football. But I like to consider myself more of a like general jack of all trades consumer rather than the specific one sport cat, which fair credit to those people who do, man. I mean, I have nothing but the utmost respect for people like my, my bro, uh, Nick, who is an avid uh, football fan, soccer fan, and he also has a YouTube channel, which Oh boy, for the life of me, I cannot just remember off the top of my head. But I will look that up. You know, I'm going to provide some links in the description. Because these two cats, I appreciate, respect a hell of a lot. Good people. And with Nick, uh, pure football focus, pure, pure football driven. Uh, Manchester United guy. And his knowledge is just so in-depth and so great. And... It's things like that where I, where I see content creators or cats that I know who are so knowledgeable that I have to go to them and, you know, pick their brains a little bit and see what they're thinking. Because it's it's perspective, man. It, it's, it's knowledge, right? It's something that could provide some sort of paradigm shift and makes you look at things in a different way. So with that being said, you know, Arsenal Football Club, the team that I cheer for, you know, for a number of years, I've always been in the mindset of, oh, just my team, nobody else, I'm not going to pay attention to anything else. But, you know, when you do that, you limit, um, really, the broad landscape of what's going on, context, and all these good things. And really, it took me years to get to this point now where I could, you know, have a general view of things in sports and have a more... Is the word esoteric? I, like, I'm, I'm fucking up my vocabs here, but like a very like a like, cool down, like non-feeling appreciation for you know all the sports ball teams, all the sports ball aspect. Even you know as an Arsenal fan, I fucking hate Tottenham. You know I could give a shout out to Jose Mourinho, the absolute cuntbag. Who, yeah, you, you're establishing yourself as one of the better coaches in Europe because every time you go somewhere, you end up making good on your word and having a very competitive team. Uh, face for top four, top five in any uh, given domestic league, right? In Europe. But again, you're Tottenham and you are garbage, so whatever. <laughs> but with all that said, with all that uh, tolerance, <laughs> so to speak, Arsenal Football Club, my football club, has made some moves. Yes, they've made some moves. And in an effort to try to understand the move, right, where... Arsenal Football Club went ahead and signed two loanies. Well, one of them, it's not official, in Martin Odegaard, right? And we'll talk about him in a little bit. But Arsenal goes ahead and signed uh, loanee Matt Ryan, goalkeeper of Brighton and Hove Albion. Australian, who has been with the uh, Brighton and Hove Albion squad for quite some time. I haven't looked at the stats stat specifically, but I would imagine he's been there for a while because I do recall his name popping up a couple of times, you know, match days or FA Cups. So, really cool to see this cat's interview talking about, oh, you know, when I was a kid in the school days in Australia, I used to get up at 4 a.m. and watch, you know, watch football. And immediately, you know, as a fan in America, 
you know, watching Premier League matches and, um, you know, in the bar in wee, wee hours of the morning at like 4, 6 a.m., I could totally relate. And I look at the kid like, all right, Matt Ryan, I can respect what you're saying. And it's another thing where I, I can understand that maybe Arsenal didn't have too much confidence in our backup goalkeeper who we just recently acquired over the summer and Runnerson and you know 24 25 year old kid maybe have a hard time adjusting to the Premier League especially with goalies I mean they can take forever I mean look at Emmy Martinez it took him a while to just explode like that but I think you know thinking about it in hindsight I mean initially when the move was announced I was kind of perplexed like why did you bring another goalkeeper uh, you, we already got Runnerson but yeah if you don't need um, Runerson to just be up there, you know, straight up where you put insurmountable pressure on him in, in cup matches or in Europe, you know, it could fuck you. So in that sense, I think Matt Ryan coming in is good. I'm pretty sure he's going to be used in the Europa League more than the Premier League capacity. And, you know, this being a loan signing, I'm hoping it turns into a cheap affordable deal over the summer if he can gel well with the squad and you're gonna see a lot of interesting um, roster dynamics with Arsenal Football Club over the next few months and I think Martin Odegaard is definitely a sign of interesting things to come because if if we recall boys and girls in the realm of football Martin Odegaard a couple of years ago was his wunderkid coming out of uh, Norway, if I'm not mistaken, right? Is he Norwegian? I think he is. And the skills and, and the fucking, the ball handling by this kid was absolutely phenomenal, but he just kind of petered out. You know, loan spells out of Real Madrid and, you know, the hyping down of the kid, it, it just never felt as though he was going to reach the highs of highs, right? But here we are couple of years later when I was super jealous of uh, Real Madrid signing up Martin Odegaard, Arsenal may be in contention or reportedly have already, you know, signed him as a loney. And all I can say is awesome, awesome uh, to test out your midfield. And when you know damn well that Danny Ceballos is probably not going to be back after his loan deal this year, it's good to have options. It's good to see younger prospects come in and maybe try a little plug and play kind of deal and with Arsenal Football Club I said this at the beginning of the year you know I, I really do think we settle in for a seventh or eighth spot quarterfinal exits in most cup competitions and if that happens I'm not really all that mad all I'm looking at from Arsenal Football Club is can you make the proper steps towards a brighter future towards you know a let's say uh a solid core that you can ride and die with and you you plug and play young guys in there and you know generate some sort of legacy and greatness with this with this management with you know Arteta and then you got Edu as a technical director and I don't know man as an Arsenal fan I, I don't really have a lot of expectations this season I never did and so you know, nowadays I'm just watching these guys, seeing how they take care of business, and, you know, lately they've been doing really well, ever since the Boxing Day match against Chelsea, who, by the way, Chelsea's been playing like shit ever since they lost to Arsenal, which, it blows my mind, and I have to go back on the statement I made about Frank Lampard, I think after the FA Cup, like, you're, you're kind of overrated, I think, and I hate saying that, because I think Frank Lampard was a brilliant player, and, you know, he has, mo he had moments of, you know, tactical soundness with uh, Darby County but man Frank I don't know I'm not I'm not really uh, not really enthused about his effort this season but what can you really do man the Premier League is a fucking bloodbath I mean you know, look at Liverpool they just lost to Burnley 1-0 and nobody expected it there was it was Liverpool's first home loss in about oh god what over two dozen matches was that right it's ridiculous but it just goes to show you, like, no one is safe in the Premier League, and that's why it's fucking amazing and awesome. You know, any sort of league with abundance of parity is a fun league, right? Although, yeah, the NBA, they don't really know what that means. 
because the NBA is founded on dynasty. Technically true, yes. But when you simplify the argument like that for the NBA, I feel like you dumb it down for everybody. Like, yes, the Warriors were a dynasty. Yes, they were. But the reality, too, is, you know, if you look closely at those NBA Finals series, if you look closely at those buildups to getting to the NBA Finals, man, there were some tough teams. There were some tough-ass squads, man. And the problem nowadays, whenever you talk to somebody about the NBA, it's just all recency bias shit, and there's no sense of looking at the totality of what's going on. And so, as a Lakers fan, I get really fucking annoyed when people say, oh, we're going to repeat automatic championship. Oh, we got Trez, baby. Oh, we got Mark. We're going to win automatically fucking second. Shut the fuck up, dude. Nothing is given here. Like, yes, the Lakers are stacked. We host a fucking uh, Milwaukee Bucks team last night who down the wire, they, they brought some tension and, and some anxiety down the line, but there was really no other fucking way it was going to go for the Bucks against the Lakers. I mean, the Lakers are going to win. But, man, to just say that, oh, Lakers are going to automatically win, this is a given. It's not a given. It's not a given. The Lakers have looking, been looking really shaky, even with the 12-4 record. I look at the Golden State uh, Warriors game on Martin Luther King Day uh, for, the, uh, for the Los Angeles Lakers, and I think, dude, you really need to address that fucking problem right there. Your last minute tactical situation, uh, like the scenarios, it, it's absolute dog shit. Now I'm looking at Frank Vogel. I'm looking at uh, uh, Hollins. I'm looking at fucking uh, Kid, right? I'm looking at the staff and maybe looking at a guy like LeBron James and saying to myself, how have none of you understood that there is a fucking timeout and you don't understand how to fucking manage time and you're professionals? What the fuck is going on? These are the little things that you have to work on, man. That's how you create habits of excellence. And through that, you create chemistry, you create the culture, and then boom. You face the best of the best, try to win, and that grind leads you to a championship. Am I oversimplifying it? Perhaps, perhaps I am. But damn it all, it's sports. You can't get arrogant. You can't get complacent. You know what happens when you do that? You become the fucking Clippers. You become the fucking Brooklyn Nets. Oh, but they've been... I don't want to hear shit about the Brooklyn Nets right now, man. Because I've been overhearing this from everybody. Oh, they're going to win. They're going to win. How are they going to win when they can't even beat Colin Sexton, bro? Fuck out of here. Shout out to my man, Colin Sexton. And I doubted the Cavs and Colin Sexton. I did. I'm not going to lie to you. You can look back at the tapes. There are so many fucking videos. I talk about the NBA, and I doubt the Cavs whenever I do talk about them. But, ooh-wee, the Cavs got a nice young core. They did trade out Kevin Porter Jr. to the Houston Rockets. Of course, he was a bit of a headache. But the Cavs, man, teams that are low-key good but won't get enough attention unless some magical thing happens like they beat the big three. Utter nonsense. And this is why mainstream NBA coverage is garbage. It's fucking trash. Just go watch individual games. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to plug everybody I, I, I watch personally. Because I feel as though majority of these people, either experts uh, or uh, specific tribe folks, but they're honest. They're honest motherfuckers. Right? I don't know what they're actual motherfuckers could fight. That'd be slander kids. <laughs> don't be fucking with that shit. But uh, a funky diabetic on YouTube is a phenomenal uh, NBA coverage guy. The dude knows what he's talking about for most NBA squads. And he even admits when he doesn't know something. The Boston Celtics fan. And the guy tries to talk about everything and anything that's major going on in the NBA. Uh, trends as some teams do well and some teams do poorly. And, you know, as somebody who just consumes YouTube nonstop, as you know, I've, I've made it very clear, boys and girls, I cancel all my streaming services except YouTube. And even VRV, I cancel that shit too. But it's because of that, like, I can just focus on, you know, sports ball shit, which 
There's so many good choices on YouTube. There's so many quality content creators if you just look out for them. Don't just settle for the mainstream shit, man. It's garbage. It's mostly garbage. Even though the next thing I'm, I'm about to talk about is it's technically mainstream, but is it really? Is it really? And of course, I'm talking about UFC. And UFC 257 being an absolute, I don't know, like blockbuster, perhaps? You got Poirier and uh, Poirier, if I'm you know, mistakenly calling that name, I apologize, but you know, I'm, I'm a dum-dum. You got King Connor, Lord McGregor, back in the octagon. And boys and girls, I can't wait. I got my CMG shirt ready for tomorrow. And, you know, my betting buddies are saying, oh, Connor's going to get that knockout in the first round. Oh, man, I'm excited to see that. And for me, being a complete UFC newbie, and I will fully admit to that, I am a fucking newbie when it comes to it. Connor has a different vibe to him this time around. The way he's presenting himself, the way he's approaching the stage, the way he's talking, and the, the look in his eyes, very different from Connor maybe two, three years ago. Maybe it's the humility factor. Maybe it's the fact of all this shit happening last year. Maybe it's the fact of, you know, the man in Khabib, who really put the number on him, you know, having his whole scenario, which, I mean, I, you know, with Khabib, as a Conor Mc, uh, McGregor fan, of course, you know, you're butthurt about the fucking loss, but the, the reality, too, is, like, Khabib lost his father, I believe, last year, if I'm not mistaken, and it's just been turmoil for the lad, and he gets the win last year, and gets out on a high and I couldn't be happier for the guy. I mean, he might come back. Who the hell knows? That's kind of the nature with UFC uh, fighters wanting to come back and they do age uh, hell with age. I mean, they usually do sometimes, but I think all of these things influence how Connor presents himself. And to me, again, as a complete newbie to me, Connor just has this next level vibe. Like he, it's like my brother said, he has Super Saiyan Blue vibes. Uh, and if you don't know what the fuck we're talking about here, it's Dragon Ball Super. Uh, and I, yes, there is more than Dragon Ball Z. There's more than Dragon Ball. There's Dragon Ball Super. There's Dragon Ball GT. There's all this crap. But uh, Super Saiyan Blue is one of the more powerful Super Saiyan transformations that you get in the Dragon Ball series. And yeah, Connor just has that transformation vibe to him right now. And it's kind of awesome. And I can't wait to see it in action. I think, honestly, man, that first round knockout seems pretty reasonable. I mean, with the way the guy has been developing and the way the guy looks, I don't know. And then a lot of my uh, UFC experts, the cats who watch this, who worship the sport, and I respect to them, they're saying kind of the same thing, that Connor is in a different tier right now in terms of energy and vibe. And I think he can ride that to a hopefully dominant win tomorrow. I'd love to see that. As a Connor fan, of course. And, hey, should be good. UFC 257, my boys and girls. But what isn't so good is, you know, a passing of a legend. All right, so Hank Aaron passes away today in a month where, man, baseball legends are just leaving this realm, man. It's crazy. Hank Aaron, Tommy Lasorda, Don Sutton, I mean, Jesus, man. It's a bummer. It's Hank Aaron, even as a baseball newbie, but you know, super nerd of the fucking Futurama series. I, I, can, I can appreciate Hank Aaron. I can appreciate, you know, the precedence and, you know, the greatness that he set up in baseball. And you can argue that absolutely. You got all these new young cats whether it be in the 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010s, or now, you know, they look up to Hank Aaron. They looked up to him, still look up to him, and find inspiration. His greatness knows no name. But it does. I mean, it does. I mean, it, what am I fucking saying? So greatness, yes, it, it does know names, but at the same time, names aren't, aren't, aren't important. It's the impact of what an individual does, and Hank Aaron definitely did live in, leave a uh, wonderful impact in the realm of baseball, so huge shout to him. And boys and girls, on the next episode, as we 
take our pause here. We're gonna talk POTUS, rim job, and KKK. You'll know what the fuck I'm talking about. But boys and girls, for next time, I'll be there. Fuck off.